Just again, wanted to introduce myself. My name is Christopher Rausch. I'm from Drexel University. Um, before I get into um, the the ARC identifiers, I just wanted to preview um, a short commercial because uh, um, we're talking about the ARCs and um, this is something that I thought would introduce them well. Now that I've shown you the initial commercial and I was not compensated in any way for displaying that, um, I want to issue a disclaimer that there are some terrible puns in this presentation. I've mixed some metaphors and for presentation purposes, um, there are some dubious implementation of metadata standards, um, but they're worth it because they're, um, they're parts of the joke. So first I wanted to introduce myself and this is an art for people. So this is another name for me um, around here, I'm also known as Q3T as uh, sort of a nickname. And this is a note that I have not yet been published, um, <clears throat> which is a joke. I should have a laugh track in the end of this, but this is some metadata about me. Um, this is uh, the type of, of record that we're trying to produce in response to somebody querying for an ARC. Um, now, this is the Metadata Research Center is a part of the College of Computing and Informatics at the Drexel University. It is entirely dedicated to the advancement of metadata. As you can see, there are um, there's a Twitter presence, and um, I currently work with the Metadata Research Center along with my advisor. Here is a picture of the crew. It's a fine looking bunch, as you can see. Um, unfortunately, this picture was taken before uh, I actually joined, so I have um, altered it slightly to um, this will be posted on the website rather soon if I can get approval for it. I'm, I'm not sure if I will not. So the crew, um, when we started working on ARCs, it was a joint effort, um, which is something that's really interesting about CCI and the Metadata Institute is that people sort of get together and collaborate on things in an ad hoc basis. And it was uh, sort of almost by accident that you know this group got joined together, but here are the people that are working on the 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 ARCs and using them in their research. And you can see that uh, Matt Kelly is my, my advisor, Jane Greenberg, she is uh, the captain of the ship. Um, Sam is a fellow graduate student who does, um, you know, a lot of the research in the background. Uh, Joan, I guess if we're doing the crew analogy or metaphor would be our chief engineer. Um, Peter is uh, the subject matter and humanities expert that, uh, you know, who actually um, decides the direction of the research, and John is the actual architect of the the ARC um, identifier scheme, and is um, at the California Digital Library. So, um, why did I get selected to do this talk? Uh, here's a nice graphic because I am the low person on the totem pole. Um, here's another way of looking at it, though, and that's actually Sam, and that's me. <laughs> so that. The jokes are out of the way. <laughs> I'll talk about what is an ARC. Um, you know, this is a conference dedicated to persistent identifier. So obviously it's a persistent identifier. And I think the name and the play on the name is that, you know, the ARC survives uh, no matter what happens um, and it should be persistent over time. And here you see um, any persistent identifier have commonalities amongst all of them and sometimes it's a personal personal preference to choose you know which identifier scheme that you you do um, but I uh, want to answer the question is the the arc yet another persistent identifier um, and I'll talk a little bit about the implementation but first of all here's another metaphor on an arc and this is the, kind of the only way that I could uh, slip in this 
this uh, clip from my favorite movies, but arcs, you know, here's another metaphor for the Ark and the Ark of the Covenant, which also contains information. And here is, uh, you know, the, the scholar wondering if there is metadata inside. So he does open it. <coughs> And as you can see, there are dire consequences. So hopefully that doesn't happen to you when you implement ARCs. Um, I'm still here to speak about it. Um, this is just a brief overview of the archival resource key. This um, particular ASCII art, and I reproduced it because I really do like ASCII art, comes from the URL you see on the bottom of the screen, and that's the registry. Um, and what uh, it's a basic description, and it's, uh, as I said, also a metaphor. The art consists of a, a, um, several components which sort of mirror um, or in parallel to other, other identifier schemes in that they have, you know, the scheme identifier, then uh, sort of a hierarchical identification. Um, and here there is, you know, I'll let you read the slide, but there are certain things that were relevant to our implementation of the art that that uh, I wanted to highlight. Uh, first is the shoulder. Um, the shoulder is, again, part of the key that is a, a designator for a sub namespace so that if um, there is a broader category, an individual organization can differentiate its, its identifiers from uh, other types of identifiers. And this becomes useful when, um, when you're using uh, the shared NANDs, which um, Normally, the, the name assigned authority numbers are assigned to a particular institution, and those um, are the ones, that institution is the one that mints the ARC. And uh, they're responsible for the, the, the persistence and the resolvability of the ARC. There are also um, common identifiers for things such as terms and people. And the shoulder is a way of differentiating which institutions own which uh, particular um, term, yeah, and this is a man request form. Um, recently, the ARC, um, the ARC Alliance came up, um, came online with its website, which a lot of this information I thought I sort of had an exclusive license to, but most of it was just published um, and went live the other day. So there's lots of information on ARC.org, and that uh, that link was was also in the in the commercial that you saw before. But the the first um, portion of of developing an ARC for an organization is to actually request a NAN. And the name assigned authority number is uniquely assigned to individual institutions or cultural heritage organizations. And the if you, in case you're interested, this is the draft standard of the ARC uh, naming um, uh, of a persistent identifier scheme. So this is a draft standard. The current standard is uh, slightly behind this, but we use this in order to um, implement our uh, version of ARCs in order to uh, in, in order to be future forward facing. So um, the ARC is is um, there's no central authority for an ARC. So um, the implementation is is up to the individual user, um, and that's that's or the individual cultural institution that maintains the the NAN, and and that's a good thing at least for development purposes. Um, also, uh, in terms of persistence, you know, there's, uh, there's, I'm sure, lots of different approaches to persistence. But the one, one of the things that um, differentiated the arc in in our research is that the persistence is um, a matter of service, and that the there's no general technical means that um, that is better than having an organization commit its resources to persisting an identifier. And that means to have a plan for succession and also for a plan to make them resolvable um, should things change, such as the name of the institution or the affiliation, or as the previous speaker mentioned, uh, two universities were to merge. Um, the, the, uh, the persistence, the, the, the onus would be on them to co continue to make their identifiers persistent. And by the nature of the ARC, it has its um, object. Um, it, it is an identifier that can be moved from, um, from institution to institution with different resolvers. So a resolver is you know, just what it sounds like. It takes the 
actual ARC itself and translates it into a corresponding URL. Um, now there's a, an n2t.net names to things, which is a resolver that um, can be universally used and it's a service offered by the California Digital Library. And um, having the prepending this to your ARC will resolve it, um, provided that you're pre-registered for, um, you, your NAN is pre-registered and that you have a server on the other side to redirect your inquiry. And here's kind of the anatomy of the n2t server and this is important not for the details but because the resolver itself which is what intercepts the art when it's made into a url um, forwards it to the response the, the the organization responsible for persisting it and usually that will be the same organization that's responsible for the actual um, information object itself so the um the uh, nan that we're using the metadata research center which was assigned uh, is is this 13183. So any uh, arc that starts with this NAN uh, indicates that we are the persisters of the of the arc and its metadata and this corresponding cultural heritage or, or information object um, that um, that the arc identifies. There are also, as I mentioned before, some shared NANs, which means that it do they don't belong to any particular institution. They are general terms. And um, these are because there are um, really difficult questions of who can own general terms and whether or not they're actually immutable. So um, I th one of the theories behind it is that the 99152, which is the, the, uh, the, the arc for terms, um, terms don't change over time. So that individual institutions um, will be able to become the sponsors of particular terms, but they're still differentiated by the sub-naming schemes uh, that we described before, um, which is the shoulder of the arc. So I'll show you, um, and, and this is, the, uh, this is the, the, the example that we were talking about um, that the shoulder hopes to solve, at least in our implementation, is that you know, other people's identifiers, um, you know, if you, can you mint arcs, can you mint persistent identifiers for, for other objects that are not in your control or that can't be owned by one particular institution? And um, in the approach that we've taken, and I'll talk about it in a second, is that you can do this, but there has to be a way to differentiate, you know, potential conflicts. And um, in the actual arc scheme itself, it is anticipated that there will be some things that that uh, are duplicative or that that have different types of services competing to identify them, and what happens over time is that that institution, particular institutions, develop um, re um, reputations, and uh, people will choose perhaps one institution to use um, as uh, as metadata sources that they think are particularly reliable. And here's an example of an arc. Um, just in its pure form, um, the 99152 again is the uh, is the shared NAND for terms, and you can see the B4 here is the shoulder. And if you look at the um, the arcs.org breakdown of and also the, uh, the the key metaphor that we looked at before, the B4 shoulder um, is something that differentiates a particular um, concept from the rest of the unique ID. And in our case, we have associated it with a particular ontology. Now this arc, and one of the ways that the persistence is uh, intended to, to work is that the resolver can change over time. And they can, there can be multiple resolvers for, for particular arcs. And here we have, you know, as a test case, use this historical ontologies.info in order to be able to just use some, some um, to resolve the name and, um, and show um, our implementation of, of the, the terms. So we're using the Library of Congress subject headings, which is um, published in 1918, uh, 1910. And it's a, just a list of subject headings that um, has a modern alternative, uh, but this is one that has been um, made into uh, electronic that electronically accessible, and it's used um, by you know our our humanities scholars in doing the kinds of analysis of um, of terms um, using terms of of uh, to um, to uh, address concept drift over time. So, for instance, 
using a named entity recognition software or some other type of recognition software to analyze and pull terms from a corpus of work, um, this will change over time depending on the context, the temporal context. So using the 1910 subject heading um, compared to the 2020 um, LCSH um, will, will have different results. And in order to be able to uniquely identify um, that particular group, the 1910 vocabulary um, can be identified with a persistent identifier. And why would you uh, do such a thing? And this is just the opportunity that I had to um, highlight uh, another person's work who's presenting at uh, the conference because you know my favorite animal is platypus. So um, we want these historical terms to be uniquely identifiable so that they can be referred to and be disambiguated from the modern um, LCSH terms. Now, the this is the project that um, we're currently working on, the 19th Century Knowledge Project, uh, and it's using this LCSH vocabulary in order to um, generate automatic metadata for these uh, Encyclopedia Britannica um, entries. And the um, in order to be able to refer specifically to those, those entries, um, having them have a unique identifier serves two purposes because it can be used um, first in, in the development process uh, so that um, we identify the, the, the terms individually um, to be used in programming. And then second, because it in and of itself to be able to resolve a term in a particular time period can be useful. Uh, the original um, LCSH lives in a uh, a project sponsored by the Metadata Research Center, which is uh, is Hive, it's helping interdisciplinary vocabulary engineering. Whereas you can see that um, particular subject is entered, and uh, the associated uh, broader and narrow terms uh, come up. And this is an existing project um, that returns the metadata, and as you can see, in different types of formats. And the idea of adding ARCs was a later addition because we'd like to be able to have unique identifiers for these terms. Um, and we'd also um, understand that the ARC infrastructure allows for the type of architecture that, uh, that, that is layered so that um, the ARC will be the, the, the ID that joins um, individual um, uh, concepts um, from from a from an addressable standpoint. So there are other types of uh, vocabularies that exist in Hive, and all of these would uh, in, uh, eventually have their own identifiers. And um, this would be a way in in to identify the individual terms and also to refer to them programmatically if we need to. Uh, we did actually publish uh, this approach to um, computationally. Um, um, approaching the computational approach to historical ontologies as as the as the uh, the title shows um, there has been some drift over time in how we actually implemented this and this is going to be one of the things that I ask about for the audience participation portion of the question to get your feedback on because initially we took an approach to um, assigning uh, arcs for computational um, uh, for, for historical ontologies, but that has changed over time. But uh, if you're interested in the approach, um, this is the, the paper to read. It hasn't yet, the proceedings haven't yet been published, but it is available on archive.org. Um, now, there are different implementations of ARC because it is a decentralized uh, persistent identifier. People implement it in different ways. And this is um, one of the, 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 um, the models that we use, the digital libraries of, of uh, University of Texas Digital Libraries, who used ARCs in, in many different ways in order to not only identify art objects, but also to use the, the, the URL building um, facility for uh, what are called inflections in order to be able to drill down more precisely to specific, specific content types um, in, uh, to, to differentiate different arcs and so that they can be respond uh, that the URLs will re yield specific results um, for specific types of queries. Now this is uh, just our own implementation and uh, the reason that I'm going through this is it's um, sort of a technical presentation but if people are interested in um, 
de developing their own resolvers in uh, minting arcs themselves. Uh, there, there's a lot involved, and there's more that um, than we initially thought. And one of the the uh, the tasks that I had was to develop a. a, a a cost-benefit analysis of whether or not it's worth it to keep our own resolver or to use a global resolver like N2T uh, names to things. And, and this basically is just uh, one of the tools that's provided. Um, it's, it's a Perl package that allows um, an arc to be minted according to a particular uh, pattern. And these are the this this is the tool that we use to generate the the arcs and mint the IDs of the the vocabulary terms and the more information on this is actually available at the at the CPAN and and the arcs.org. So I won't go into it in great detail, but in order to get off the ground, um, there was some initial setup required in that you know there there's a, a script to be uh, there's a utility to be downloaded, there's a database to be generated. And um, from that database has to be imported into whatever uh, eventual um, system you're going to use to resolve your arcs. So here is kind of a, a, a brief overview of what it would take, or actually, you know, uh, what it's taken so far in order to bring our own resolver into the world. Now, there's many different options, again, for doing this. The N2T resolver, uh, the names to things, uh, will do this for you. Um, the Easy ID is a California library digital service, uh, California digital library service that will also uh, resolve the ARCs for you. And there's a corresponding code base that um, that you can uh, implement. It's a, it's it's difficult. Um, so we started sort of from scratch, and just internally, it was a bit difficult to find resources. I'm not sure people can relate, um, and to decide who's going to pay for what in terms of of sponsoring the project. So we made an application to uh, um, this this XC, which is sponsored by NSF. This is open to U.S based uh, institutions and they allocate computing resources um, based on um, based on a proposal that's submitted. And we were allocated certain resources on uh, Indiana University's uh, Jetstream service, which is simply um, it gave us the opportunity to, to create virtual machines that um, responded uh, that that would act as resolvers. And I'll go through this rather quickly, but this is the 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 types of things that were required in order for the, the 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 resolver to work properly, and is it necessary to use all of these things? Probably not. Um, Django, I think, would be um, Django would be probably my choice if I were to use a, a, a single approach. But all of these things um, should go into planning when creating uh, your own resolver, because, uh, for instance, we used React and. Um, there, there have to be uh, things running behind the scenes to make sure that Node is functioning properly, and um, there has to be a front end that uh, provides security. So for that, we use the NGINX server. Um, and these are just basically the, the, the different types of technologies that we ended up using in order to make sure that, uh, that our resolver followed best practices. And they're not fully implemented yet. So for instance, the RabbitMQ uh, is, uh, is a messaging service that um, will keep track of when arcs are published and when they're deleted um, and uh, will hopefully help to establish a more uh, mechanized way of ensuring persistence by keeping track of all the arcs that are out there and actively messaging um, when um, when they become stale or when things change with the the, the uh, their targets so finally here is um, the term as resolved by the historical ontologies, um, uh, the, the resolver that we have. And as you can see, we just, um, the arc is, would be the same no matter what the resolver is. Um, and this resolver is, uh, um, this resolver is, is simply an interface to, to point towards the Hive uh, vocabulary server. So as you can see on the bottom, there are different ways of returning information, but those are only, um, those are only links to an eventual API that will will provide this information. I can see that I'm running out of time, so I will just show you the final reason that we um, that we split it into so many different parts is because we want the ARC to be something that returns uh, information as a service, and uh, the this is a code for library issue that's coming up um, that. 
um, describes the process that I've talked about here. And if you're interested, uh, and it will be available shortly. So I've, with that, I will stop sharing. All right, great. Thanks, Christopher. Uh, great presentation. Um, there is a couple questions for you. Uh, we'll hit the first, you know, the top ranked question first. Uh, as an ontology engineer, should I switch to using arcs instead of pearls for my terms? Um, I think that there, um, uh, John Kunz could probably answer this question later, but I, I will, will tell you the reason that I, we chose to use arcs is because we have um, the control of when they're published and when they're created. So then when we were actually um, creating the terms in the ontology and we were working with them in internally, they didn't have to be published to an external source. So we could work with them internally before actually having to, to publish them or, or, or secure uh, the, that persistent identifier. Um, and, and that was a big advantage because um, it allowed us to, to sign the, the persistent identifiers early. So. If you are looking for um, something that you can use, um, you know, on your own terms, then then yes. If you're developing, uh, you know, some some backend service, then I found it advantageous to be able to control the persistent identifiers and control their publishing. And another question, or it's kind of a comment. Uh, be interested to hear your additional thoughts on this. Um, the Matt Lincoln said, he's curious about the assumption that terms won't change over time. Uh, vocabularies such as Getty's AAT refine their definitions and scopes often. Uh, and isn't this a, a useful tool or approach to managing the, the, the changes over time for those vocabularies? And what I mean by they don't change over time is that uh, the reason that the arcs contain a certain amount of opaqueness, so that if the name of an institution changes, for instance, you don't necessarily have to, if there were a vanity URL, um, such as Drexel.edu, and Drexel didn't exist in 20 years, the NAND could be assumed by someone else. Terms themselves won't shift for political reasons. Now, they might be redefined, but then it's up to the organization that's the owner of that particular term to um, to to uh, certify its persistence. So when it, a term does change, whatever institution is then responsible for that would be responsible for, for updating the ARC, and that would be something that would be constantly in flux. So um, when uh, you know when I when I say they don't change, I mean in terms of uh, opaqueness or or um, you know a term will always be itself, but an institution might change its name. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much. We are at time. Uh, I will post in the chat a link to Catherine Skinner's Crowdcast room. So that's the next session. It starts now. Uh, if you want to bounce over there. Uh,